Behold. My stuff. Hello again. This is Andy, and today we'll be discussing My Stuff Volume 3, Heliod, God of the Sun. Uh, like before, this video is for beginners that don't really know a lot about Commander EDH, or for more established players that are just interested at looking at other people's builds. Uh, this is a deck that I've had for quite a while. It's been slowly upgraded over the years. Uh, it used to be a mono white cat deck, but um, cats are quite underpowered, and I got sick of losing, you know, over half the time with it. But um, I still wouldn't rate this as one of my most powerful decks. It's it's definitely strong. It can do some very powerful things, but this is nothing compared to the Karn or Morath decks I shared in Volumes One and Two. Uh, here is the complete deck list. It's available on Tapped Out. I will put a link in the description. I'm not going to go through every single card in this deck, just the ones that I think synergize particularly well with the commander, or have some unique interactions, or just cards that I felt warranted a bit of discussion, ones that I felt really made the deck click and run smoothly. So let's look at the card itself. Heliod is a 4 mana. Legendary enchantment creature god, 3 and a white. It's got indestructible, and as long as your devotion to white is less than 5, Heliod isn't a creature. So devotion counts up the number of colored mana symbols, so it's not a creature if you have you know, 4 or fewer. It only becomes a creature when you have 5 or more. It's a 5-6, and its ability is other creatures you control have vigilance, and you can pay 2 and double white, so 4 to put a 2-1 white cleric enchantment creature token onto the battlefield. The fact that the tokens it makes are enchantments actually is quite important and you'll see why fairly soon. First I want to talk about the high synergy cards. So this video will be broken into parts where I'll talk about ramp and removal and you know win conditions, but I want to talk about these key cards first because these are the powerhouses of the deck. These are the ones that work incredibly well with the commander and allow you to Kind of compete against non monocolored white decks. Uh, white is largely considered to be the weakest color of the five in Commander, and the fact that you have some high synergy cards allows it to catch up against you know the green decks that are going crazy or the blue decks that are you know really dominating the game. So let's take a look at them. Uh, first, there's three creatures. Now, these are definitely not the most powerful cards in the deck, but these are ones that I really do love. Um, I've looked at decklets on EDH Rec. I always think it's good to see what other people have done with a particular commander, and I haven't really seen these cards come up at all. So in the middle there, there's Pristine Angel. Six mana, so four double white for a 4-4 flying uh, angel, and as long as it is untapped, it has protection from artifacts and from all colors. Whenever you cast a spell, you may untap Pristine Angel. If you remember, Heliod gives all of your creatures vigilance, so having a Pristine Angel with vigilance means it's able to attack without tapping, which means it always has protection from artifacts and from all colors, which is incredibly strong for pushing through damage to kill planeswalkers or just go directly at the face, or defensively, it's a very strong card to have untapped and just can't be touched by anything. Archangel of Tides over there on the left hand side is 4 mana, 1 triple white. Now that triple white is very useful for when you're trying to build up devotion if you want Heliod to be a creature. You'll also see that some other cards in the deck, uh, particularly one of the lands, uh, works very well with devotion. So having that triple white is very strong. So for 4 mana what do you get? Well you get a 3-5 flying angel and it's got two very interesting abilities. As long as Archangel of Tides is untapped, creatures can't attack you or a planeswalker you control unless their controller pays one for each of those creatures. If Archangel of Tides has Vigilance, it means it's always going to be untapped. So that taxing effect is, should always be there, as long as you have Heliod and it in play. Uh, its sec its uh, other ability is, as long as Archangel of Tides is attacking, creatures can't block unless their controller pays one for each of those creatures. Uh, this is a token deck, so if you're attacking with a lot of tokens, they have to pay one to block each one of those creatures, which in some cases makes your army unblockable, which is very strong. So this is a card that isn't going to win the game on its own, but a, bit, a little bit like Pristine Angel. It works very well with the fact that you have Vigilance, and it works offensively and defensively. I just think it's a sweet card in the deck. Over on the right hand side is one of my pet cards for this deck, one that I'm shocked I haven't seen people play on um, EDH Rec. 
is Dawn Elemental. So quadruple white, four mana, and it's a 3-3 flyer, and prevent all damage that would be dealt to Dawn Elemental. So this card is great because it turns on your devotion right away, because he, Dawn, uh, Heliod plus Dawn Elemental is five devotion, so your four mana commander immediately is a 5-6 indestructible. And that prevent all damage that would be dealt to it means that it's incredible defensively. Not quite as good as Pristine Angel, but it's very strong to have there just to slow down early offensive uh, moves by your opponents. Another card that works very well in this deck, and it is a recent addition, so I've put it in, I haven't had a chance to play with it yet, is Katilda Dawnheart Martyr. So for one double white, so three mana, Legendary Spirit Warlock, it's a star star, and it has flying lifelink and protection from vampires. Katilda, Dawnheart's Martyrs, power and toughness are equal to the number of permanents you control that are spirits and or enchantments. So this is an enchantment heavy deck. This should, most of the time, be at the very least a 3-3, flying lifelink, protection from vampires, but it can scale to where late game you've got 6, 7, 8 enchantments in play. It gets quite big, and if you can give this thing vigilance, which is a keyword it doesn't have, it just makes it another really potent threat that's great defensively. And it's got Disturb, so if it does get killed, or board wiped, or whatever, uh, you can cast it from your graveyard by paying 3 double white for it to be a legendary aura. And this means you can enchant a creature, and enchant a creature has flying, lifelink, protection from vamp vampires, and it gets plus x plus x, where x is the number of permanents you control that are spirits and or enchantments, if that aura would be put into a, gra a graveyard from anywhere you exile it instead. So you're getting Katilda's ability again on the aura, and I know the protection from vampires doesn't matter too much, but it's nice in white where you have a good card on one side and then you can get a little bit of value by casting it again from your graveyard. So it is a two for one in a sense, which in white doesn't generate too much raw card advantage, although Wizards has been working on that and they've been steadily printing a lot of cards that have been helping white catch up to the more powerful colors. So this is a new card, new card in the deck, I'm excited to play with it, um, but I wanted to show that it is in this 2021 build, uh, late in the year as we are. Uh, other high synergy cards, uh, there's Sphere of Safety, which uh, is a 5 mana enchantment, 4 and a white. Creatures can't attack you or a planeswalker you control unless the controller pays X for each of those creatures, where X is the number of enchantments you control. Remember, Heliod is an enchantment and makes enchantment tokens, and there's a lot of enchantments in this deck, so it's very easy for this card to price your opponents out of being able to attack you. You have four enchantments in play. Remember, it counts itself as well. They have to pay four for each creature, which a lot of decks can't deal with, particularly go-wide strategies with a lot of tokens. And it just disincentivizes your opponents to target you for an attack if, um, you know, if there's an open board, they'll probably go for your opponents instead. Skybind is another incredibly high synergy card in this deck. It's also a 5-mana enchantment, but has double white. Um, and it's got Constellation. So whenever Skybind or another enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, exile target non-enchantment permanent. Return, return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. So Heliod makes enchantment token creatures, so pay four, make an enchantment token creature, you can blink something. If it's a token, it's just gone forever. Or you can do it to your own things that have Enter the Battlefield uh, ability. Uh, other high synergy cards that you know could be included in the token section that'll come up in a bit, but really do uh, merit discussion here, are Ajani's Chosen and Archon of Sun's Grace. Um, they do very similar things. Archon of Sun's Grace is a much better version of Ajani's Chosen, but Ajani's Chosen is the original. So, uh, Ajani's Chosen has, whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, create a 2-2 white cat creature token. If that enchantment is an aura, you may attach it to the token. And Archon of Sun's Grace just you know, is a much better version where it is a 4-mana 3-4 flyer with lifelink. And Pegasus creatures you control have lifelink, and it has Constellation, that ability. Whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, create a 2-2 white Pegasus creature token with flying. So Archon of Sun's Grace, clearly better than a Johnny's Chosen, but you know, running both is no harm, especially because they synergize so well with the deck. Now let's talk about some more of the token generation in this deck. Uh, Anointed Procession is the first thing I have to talk about, where it is the white token doubler. So, three and a white for an enchantment. If an effect would create one or more tokens under your control, it creates twice that many tokens instead. So this also should be said that for treasure tokens, it, it will double as well. It's not just creatures. 
Uh, so there's the three X spells there. Finale of Glory, Secure the Waste, and White Sun Center. They all do very similar things. Um, they put X tokens into play, um, which you know is very strong and is doubled with Anointed Procession. Uh, Finale of Glory is probably the one I should really mention, where for you create for X double white, you create X two two white soldier creature tokens with vigilance. If X is ten or more, also create X four four white angel creature tokens with vigilance. So this deck, as you'll see later when I start talking about the mana, can produce absurd amounts of mana. So getting to 12 is actually not that impossible. Uh, Felidar Retreat in the middle of the top there is a fairly recent addition to the deck. It's from uh, Zendikar Rising. It's a 4 mana enchantment, 3 and a white, for, with an enchantment with Landfall. So Landfall is whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, choose one. You can create a 2-2 white cat beast creature token, or you can put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control. Those creatures gain vigilance until end of turn. So that second ability is great because it's an alternate way of giving all your things vigilance. So your Pristine Angel, or your Dawn Elemental, or your uh, Archangel of Tides can get vigilance an alternate way other than just Heliod, which means you're not entirely dependent on that one card to you know create that massive vigilance effect that really you know, makes your creatures more potent, more powerful. Um, this card, as you'll see later, will work well with cards that put extra lands into play. Um, there are a few effects like this in the deck, uh, as I'll mention again later. I'm not running the, uh, the enemy fetches or the allied fetches. They're just too expensive for this deck. This is one of my more budget builds, but you can see how this would really get out of hand if you were able to make multiple land drops in a turn. Well, now that you have all these great creatures in play or making a really massive board, Let's talk about the big win conditions. So here are the three key ones. There's uh, Divine Visitation over there on the left. Five mana enchantment, three double white. If one or more creature tokens uh, would be created under your control, that many four four white angel creature tokens with flying and vigilance are created instead. Uh, with any of those X spells that make X creatures, creature tokens, instead of making one ones or two twos, you're making four four flying angels, which is you know, incredibly powerful. Cathar's Crusade, there in the middle. This is a card I talked about in my Marath video, but it's 5 mana, uh, 3 double white. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on each creature you control. So again, incredibly good if you're making lots of tokens all at once, but still also nice if you're just making 1 token or 2 tokens a turn with Heliod. And then over there on the right hand side, True Conviction. 3 triple white enchantment. Creatures you control have Double Strike and Life Link. Uh, this one card can absolutely close out a game if you have even a semi-respectable board. Uh, there's two more that I want to talk about. Eldrazi Monument is another very recent addition to the deck. Uh, I couldn't get my hands on one for quite a while. But it's a 5 mana artifact. Creatures you control get plus 1 plus 1 and have Flying and Indestructible. At the beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice a creature if you can't sacrifice Eldrazi Monument. So this is not a card that you want to rush out quickly. You want to make sure that you have enough tokens in play that you're you know, able to sacrifice one in your upkeep, or at least make more in your upkeep to where you're not going to lose that effect. Uh, plus one plus one does not seem like that much of a bump, but flying an indestructible is huge. Uh, there are quite a number of board wipes in this deck, so if you can destroy all creatures while you have an Eldrazi Monument in play, it turns them into one-sided board wipes to where you're only killing your opponent's stuff and holding on to your own things, which anyone that's played even a couple games of Commander knows that that is a very potent uh, effect to have. And then there's Elish Norn, Grand Cenobite. Seven mana, four, seven. With Vigilance, other creatures you control get plus two, plus two, and other creature and creatures your opponents control get minus two, minus two. Uh, this card is just so strong. Uh, I run one in Marath, I run one on this one. Uh, if you have the money or have access to it, I really recommend playing it in any white token deck. There's really not much of a good reason not to play it. It is so strong, it's almost an auto-include, and I'm not a fan of auto-include cards, but this one definitely warrants a slot in your deck. So we just looked at a lot of the really powerful cards in this deck that help you win the game or will just close out the game on their own and being a 100 card singleton format, you need to try and get those with a little bit more consistency. So I find that tutors 
Although they can be a bit unfun if you're looping tutors and constantly demonic tutoring going for any card. In mono white, you do need to have a little bit of consistency, and being white, you are constrained to fairly narrow tutors, but they are still quite good. So on the left hand side there, you've got Enlightened Tutor. One white instant, search your library for an artifact or enchantment card and reveal that card, shuffle your library, then put that card on top of it. Um, this is something you can do in your upkeep before you draw, so you actually get the card that you want. And it can go for artifacts or enchantments. And as you'll see later, there are a lot of very powerful artifacts, particularly mana doublers, that this deck wants to have access to frequently. Idyllic Tutor over there on the right hand side is just two and a white for a sorcery. Search your library for an enchantment card, reveal it, and put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. So three mana, go for whatever enchantment you need. As you'll see later, there are quite a few utility enchantments, enchantments that do a number of different things. This gives you, you know, a wide selection, a lot of variety there. The plea for guidance is six mana, five and a white. Search your library for up to two enchantment cards, reveal them and put them into your hand, then shuffle your library. This is a two for one. I know it's six mana, but in white, being able to go for any two enchantments, so potentially a removal spell or a win con, uh, it's very, very strong. I gotta say, I love the art on it as well. So I talked about this deck being able to produce a huge amount of mana, and let's take a look at how that is done in this deck. The first place to start is with the mana doublers, Cage Sun, Extra Planar Lens, and Gauntlet of Power. So Cage Sun, uh, six mana artifact. As it enters the battlefield, choose a color. Creatures you control of the chosen color get plus one, plus one. Whenever a land's ability causes you to add one or more mana of the chosen color, add one additional mana of that color. So it is six, but it is definitely the strongest of these three. Gauntlet of Power over there on the right is a 5 mana artifact. When it enters the battlefield, you also choose a color. Creatures of the chosen color get plus 1 plus 1, but it's interesting to note this also pumps your opponent's creatures. And whenever a basic land, that's key, is tapped for mana of the chosen color, its controller adds an additional 1 mana of that color. So this also affects your opponents. So hopefully you're not playing against another mono white deck, because you're doubling their mana as well, but they'll get to untap with, with it in play before you will. In the center there is Extra Planar Lens. So, kind of an unusual card. So it's a three mana artifact and it's got Imprint. When Extra Planar Lens comes into play, you may remove target land you control from the game. Remove it, exile. Whenever a land with the same name as the imprinted card is tapped for mana, its controller adds one mana to his or her mana pool of any type that land produced. Now that is why this deck is running Snow Covered Lens. So snow-covered basics are called snow-covered planes instead of just planes. So if your opponents want to get the benefit of having the mana doubler in play of this mana doubler, they will need to be playing snow-covered basics, which is a little bit, or snow-covered planes, which is a little bit less likely than them just playing normal planes. So uh, playing snow-covered planes is a way of edging the downside of your opponents also getting the effect. Hopefully they're not also playing snow-covered planes. Uh, this deck, as you can see with the cards I just showed you, definitely needs a steady supply of basic snow-covered planes. Um, the original one of these is land tax right there in the center. For one white, it's an enchantment, and during your upkeep, if an opponent controls more lands than you, you may search your library and, and remove up to three basic land cards and put them into your hand, and then shuffle your library. So in your upkeep, if an opponent has more lands than you, you're going to get three basics put directly into your hand, which is incredible, incredible value. Uh, Archaeomancer's map over there on the right hand, on the left hand side, is two and a white for an artifact. When Archaeomancer's map enters the battlefield, search your library for up to two basic playing cards, reveal them, and put them into your hand. Then shuffle your library. So immediately for three mana, you're getting two basics into your hand. But this artifact stays in play, and whenever an, a land enters the battlefield under an opponent's control, if that player controls more lands than you, you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield. So this is one of the newer uh, generation cards that Wizards has printed to try and make white be able to keep up with you know, green that is able to put a lot of lands into play. This card means that if your opponents keep putting more lands into play and they have more, more than you already, you can kind of try and keep up with them by putting lands into play from your hand if you have them in hand, which hopefully this deck will have. And then over there on the right hand side, there's Weathered Wayfarer. So for one white, it's a 1-1 human, uh, human Nomad Cleric, I think has been eradicated to say human. 
but you can pay one white and tap it and search your library for a land card, not basic, any land card, reveal it and put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. Play this ability only if an opponent controls more lands than you. So again, you need to have fewer lands in play than one of your opponents, but being able to you know, hypothetically search for any land in your deck each turn is very strong, very white. It's uh, definitely an auto-include in this deck if you're going for this style of, um, of land base or ramp, I guess. Uh, so this idea of having fewer lands than an opponent, it can be a bit of a drawback, which is why we're running uh, Expedition Map to go for key lands, and you can go for Karoo, which is not a very good card on its own. It's a land, and it enters, when it enters the battlefield tapped, when it enters the battlefield, sacrifice it unless you return an untapped planes you control to its owner's hand, and it taps for one and a white. Now, this in a vacuum is not a good card, but when you have cards like Land Tax, or Weathered Wayfair, or Archaeomancer's map, where you want to have fewer lands in play than an opponent, by being able to bounce a land to your hand to reduce that number that you have, it, it can really turn on all of your cards and you know, it can be invaluable in certain situations. Uh, a better version of this is Guildless Commons. Uh, enters the battlefield tapped. When it enters the battlefield, return a land you control to its owner's hand and it taps for double colorless. Now you will see that this card is unfortunately absent from my deck list. I just cannot get my hands on one. Um, I don't have easy access to an online store, so I rely on my LGS or the people I know. And yeah, I just have not come across one of these, but I promise you, as soon as I do get my hands on one, I will be in this deck faster than the Flash. Other, more traditional forms of ramp, I suppose, uh, there's Pearl Medallion. So there's a medallion for each uh, color. Uh, there's Pearl, Sapphire, Jet, whatever the other ones are. But there are two mana artifacts, and this one is Pearl Medallion, so white spells you cast cost one less to cast, which you know, is very strong. It doesn't seem like it's that good to new players, but having all of your white spells reduced by one uh, means that you can very quickly you know, flood the board with your spells, empty out your hand. Smothering Tide is a relatively new card, for me anyway, I've been playing for a while. And it's a four mana enchantment, three and a white, and whenever an opponent draws a card, that player may pay two, if the player doesn't, you create a colorless treasure artifact token with tap, sacrifice this artifact, add one mana of any color. So this is like the white version of Ristic Study. Ristic Study is a two and a blue enchantment. Whenever an opponent casts a spell, they may pay one. If they don't, you draw a card. Uh, this one, in a way, some people would argue is actually more powerful because people undervalue you making treasures. They think, oh, it's just mana. It's not actually getting them cards into hand. But the fact that it costs two more, and a lot of people are playing cards that draw them, you know, two, three, four cards at a time, they'll have to pay for each one as well as the card they draw each turn. So this one, people are, you know, less willing to pay the tax for. They're not willing to give up those sweet tithes. So you can quickly fill up your board of treasures. And remember that we have Anointed Procession. So if you have Anointed Procession and Smothering Tithe in play, you're making two treasure treasures instead of just one. So Smothering Tithe, it definitely has shot up in uh, price uh, recently, but if you have one or you can get your hands on one, it's definitely an excellent addition into a mono white deck. And, you know, I run it in some of my non-mono decks as well. It's uh, just a very strong card. Now let's talk about Heliod's draw package. Now I'm not going to discuss every card that draws in this deck, but let's see what we have. Now white is kind of famous for having terrible card draw, uh, but because we're monocolored and we're playing a lot of artifacts, you are, you're able to hedge against that a little bit. So in the middle there, we've got Endless Atlas. Two mana artifact, pay two, tap it, draw a card, activate this ability only if you control three or more lands with the same name. Uh, like I said, we are playing Snow Covered Plains and we are playing a lot of them. I believe we're playing 26 of them. So this basically becomes pay two each turn to draw a card, which is very strong. On the left hand side there we've got Immortal Sun, which is a 6 mana legendary artifact. Players can activate Planeswalker's loyalty abilities. At the beginning of your draw step, draw an additional card. Spells you cast cost 1 less to cast. And creatures you control get plus 1 plus 1. That's 4 very strong abilities, and you will notice that this deck is not playing any Planeswalkers at all. I found that the mono-colored white, the mono-white Planeswalkers aren't actually 
that strong. Um, they make tokens or they put counters on things, but they're not as potent. And the Immortal Sun is so strong that it actually does shut down a lot of opponents' decks. And you don't want to have a situation where, in white, where you really are trying to get as much card advantage as you can as often as you can. You really can't you know, have a dead card in your hand when it could have been anything else. So I've made the decision to go Planeswalker free in this deck, which maximizes the value of the Immortal Sun. Everything else it does, drawing extra cards, reducing the cost of your spells, pumping your creatures, particularly in a token deck like this, it, it's just an incredible card in this deck. On the right hand side, there is Scroll Rack. So, Scroll Rack is a two mana artifact, and you pay one and tap it to exile any number of cards from your hand face down. Put that many cards on the top of your library into your hand, then look at the exile cards and put them on top of your library in any order. Now, this <clears throat> may not be immediately clear to be incredibly strong, but let's look at a card we already discussed Land Tax. So this is a classic two card card advantage engine uh, for mono white. So if you remember land tax puts three extra basic lands into your hand in your upkeep if an opponent has more lands in play than you. Scroll rack lets you set aside cards from your hand to essentially draw that many cards. So if you're getting three extra lands into your hand each turn with land tax, you're turning that into being able to draw three extra cards a turn with scroll rack. And land tax nicely searches your library and forces you to shuffle, so you actually get to shuffle away those lands that you put from your hand on top of your library each turn. This is raw card advantage, and if you can get both of them into play, you're going to be set up in a very nice position to you know, do well in the game. These are some other really nice uh, draw effects that you know steadily gain you advantage. So skull clamp is one mana equipment, pay one to equip, equip creature gets plus one, minus one, and whenever it dies, you draw two cards. So remember that Heliod makes two one enchantment token creatures, uh, so they're going to die to Skull Clamp. And I know it sounds like a lot to pay five to draw two cards between Heliod's ability and equipping the Skull Clamp, but in mono white, and when you have a lot of mana from doubling all your planes or all your you know, permanents or lands that tap for white, Five is not bad to be putting cards into your hand and help you keep up with the blue decks or the black deck or you know the green decks that are drawing excess cards. Mentor of the Meek uh, is a card I also run in Morath, but it's two and a white for a two-two. Whenever another creature with power two or less enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay one. If you do, draw a card. Uh, Heliod makes two ones, and you're making a lot of one-one or two-two tokens. And having to pay an extra one whenever one of them comes into play is fine if it's drawing you cards. Uh, Mangara the Diplomat from M21 is 4 mana, 3 and a white for a 2-4 uh, legendary human cleric with lifelink. Whenever an opponent attacks with creatures, if two or more of those creatures are attacking you and or planeswalkers you control, we don't really care about that in this deck, draw a card. So it disincentivizes opponents to attack you and when they do attack you it rewards you with a card. And whenever an opponent casts their second spell each turn, draw a card. This is something I've found to actually be the most powerful ability on the card, because a lot of times in a multiplayer game, people have lots of mana, they're drawing lots of cards, they want to play more than one spell a turn, and they don't necessarily have to be attacking you, it's just you're getting extra cards for them doing the things they naturally want to do. So Mangara is a very strong card, and I really recommend it for any mono-white deck. Uh, I've even seen people play this as their commander just because drawing extra cards is you know, so important for this color to be able to keep up. Seer Sundial is also in this deck. It's got landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay two if you do draw a card. Now, I know it's a four mana artifact, and I know it's quite slow, but it is a way of you know maintaining the flow of cards and helping you keep up with your opponents. And you know this deck hopefully has a lot of lands in hand. Hopefully you are hitting a land drop each turn, Paying an extra two to draw a card is you know, not that big a cost. Now I want to talk about one of White's specialties, which is board wipes, being able to clear an entire board of creatures. So I'm running four. I've got Settle the Wreckage as an honorary uh, board wipe. Uh, Settle the Wreckage is two and double white, so four mana for an instant. Exile all attacking creatures target player controls. That player may search his or her library for that many basic land cards, put those lands, put those cards onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle, then shuffle his or her library. 
Uh, so they don't necessarily have to be attacking you, but this is a way of getting around indestructible. And remember it costs four Heliod's ability, costs four to activate. So it might look like you're just leaving up mana to activate Heliod, where instead you actually have Settle the Wreckage in hand. Uh, there's Faded Retribution over there on the left hand side down at the bottom. Four Triple White, so seven mana instant. Destroy all creatures and planeswalkers. If it's your turn, scry two. So you're not often going to cast this on your turn because the scry two is not that big a deal. But the fact it kills creatures and planeswalkers, and remember we're not playing any planeswalkers, so it's nice to have that in play, uh, to have that in your deck where you can wipe out, let's say, uh, you know, a planeswalker deck, or you know, someone's just playing a few, you can kill those as well as their creatures. Uh, then beside that we've got Route. 3, double white. Sorcery, you may cast Route as though it had Flash if you pay 2 more, so a lot of times you will be casting this for 7, because instant, instant speed board wipes are very powerful, and destroy all creatures, they can't be regenerated, so I love this card, particularly because with this deck you've got Heliod, you're normally passing turn with mana open, being able to you know cast an, uh, a board wipe at instant speed, it can really catch some opponents unawares, or you can board wipe at the end of the turn just before yours, and then you get to untap on an open board. Uh, remember, Heliod has Indestructible, which you know, definitely has value. And then over there on the right-hand side, we've got Martial Coup. Uh, X, white, white, create X, one, one, white soldier creature tokens. If X is five or more, destroy all other creatures. So let's talk about these a little bit more in depth. So first, we've settled the wreckage. Now, you might think that the downside of giving your opponents lands is normally a bad thing. Uh, I do want to note that in EDH, people don't run that many basics. Um, they trying to, if they're playing a multicolor deck, they're trying to fix their uh, colors with you know dual lands, or maybe they're playing a lot of tech lands with non-basics. Uh, so there's a chance that they're not going to be able to get that many lands into play. But Settle the Wreckage really works in this deck because of the cards like Land Tax or Weathered Wayfair or our Chaomancer's map that you know benefit you having an opponent that has more lands than you. So Settle the Wreckage really works well with these cards, and I think it has earned its place in this deck. Uh, Martial Coup, being able to board wipe and make tokens, works incredibly well with Divine Visitation or Cathar's Crusade, or both maybe. Um, but it's a way of you know, maximizing the value you get of wiping the board, putting tokens into play, and just, you know, maybe being able to close out the next turn because you've made a lot of 4-4 four, four angels or you've made incredibly huge soldiers because of Cathar's Crusade. If you cast Martial Coup for X5, you get to destroy all creatures, put 5 tokens into play, but Cathar's Crusade will trigger 5 times, so you'll get 5 6 sixes, which is, you know, enormous. Being white, there's of course going to be more removal than just board wipes. Um, there are enchantment based removal, or pieces of removal that are enchantments, which of course you can tutor for with your plea for guidance or enlightened tutor if you need. The biggest one of these is Quarantine Field, so it's XX double white for an enchantment. Quarantine Field enters the battlefield with X isolation counters on it. When Quarantine Field enters the battlefield, for each isolation counter on it, exile up to one target non-land permanent and opponent controls until Quarantine Field leaves the battlefield. So if you have a lot of mana because you're doubling your planes, you can really just remove you know, all of the problematic cards that your opponents have put into play. Uh, Active Authority is, I feel, a very underrated card uh, for one double white, so three mana enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, you may exile target artifact or enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may exile target artifact or enchantment if you do as controller gains control of Active Authority. Uh, being able to kill two things off of one card is great, being able to exile them is even better, and having double white devotion is also very strong. In a multiplayer setting, uh, oftentimes if you use the second ability uh, to exile a second thing and you give it to an opponent, there's a chance that someone else has something more threatening or more dangerous than you, something that has to be dealt with right away. So a lot of times this card can pass between players and not always going after your stuff. Then lastly, we've got Grasp of Fate. One double white, so three mana enchantment. And when it enters the battlefield, for each opponent, exile up to one target non-land permanent that player controls until Grasp of Fate leads the battlefield. So potentially being a three for one, that also gives you double white devotion. 
all three of these, I think, are excellent in this deck. Uh, you know, and can really get you out of some tight jams. Uh, there are a lot of dangerous artifacts and enchantments, like, I don't know, Bolus's Citadel, or Platinum Angel, or whatever is really trying to shut you down, these things can answer them nicely. Darkseal Forge is a good one as well. People think they're safe when all their stuff is indestructible. These say no. And being able to search for these with Plea for Guidance means that you can go for a removal spell and maybe like your true conviction. So you can kill something and then set up the win. Another piece of removal that I do quite like in this deck is Cavalier of Dawn. So it's a 5 mana Elemental Knight, 2 triple white, so it's got that triple white devotion, which is very important in this deck. For a 4-6 Vigilance, when it enters the battlefield, destroy up to one target non-land permanent. Its controller creates a 3-3 colorless golem artifact creature token. So kind of like a beast within, I suppose. But its last ability, when Cavalier of Dawn dies, return target artifact or enchantment card from your graveyard to your hand. So as you've seen, this deck runs a lot of very strong artifacts and enchantments, particularly your mana doubles, which are kind of like your engines. This helps you get them back when this thing dies. So I like this card a lot. I think it's a solid inclusion. Now I want to talk about Recursion. Recursion in commander decks is always a good thing to have. Maybe not too much of it, because people do run graveyard hate, but it is important to be able to get your stuff back. People kill things, things die, things end up in your graveyard. Being able to get them back to your hand, particularly in white, is very useful. So there are two key pieces of, re of recursion in this deck. Sun Titan, which is a 6 mana 6 6 vigilancing giant, and when it enters the battlefield or attacks, you may return target permanent card with mana value 3 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. So this can get back your, you know, your engine artifacts or some of your useful enchantments, or maybe some of your removal enchantments. And then you have Amiria Shepherd which is a 7 mana 4-4 Flying Angel with Landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you may return target non-land permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. If that land is a Plains, you may return that non-land permanent card to the battlefield instead. So this is clearly very powerful if you're playing lots of Plains, and can help you get back your key cards, not just to your hand, but to play. So, like I mentioned before, I'm not playing the fetch lands like Flooded Strand. Uh, I've tried to keep this deck fairly budgety and or budget friendly. And I must be honest, I'm not a millionaire. So when I do get fetches, I do put them into my multicolored decks to make their mana bases more consistent. But this deck is running things like Myriad Landscape, which allows you to search for two basic land cards of the same a share type. So search for two planes and put them into play. So you can get double landfall triggers for your Amiria Shepherd, or with Sun Titan, you can just keep looping the Myriad landscape, making you know land drops every turn. Nykthos Shrine from Nyx really is the centerpiece of power lands in this. So Nykthos Shrine to Nyx is a legendary land. It taps for colorless, or you can pay two, tap it, and choose a color. Add to your mana pool an amount of mana that of that color equal to your devotion to that color. So like we said, we need devotion to turn Heliod into a creature. This deck puts a lot of white mana symbols into play. This card can sometimes tap for 5, 7, 9 mana because you have that much devotion. A very key card in this deck, and a lot of times it's what you will go for with Expedition Map just because it helps you generate so much mana that you actually can keep up with the green decks that have gone completely wild. Uh, there's also Terrain Generator. So if you're playing against someone that is ramping naturally, putting a lot of lands into play, you can get those excess planes that you got maybe with land tax and put them into play tapped with Terrain Generator. So Terrain Generator taps your colorless or you can pay two and tap it to put a basic land card from your hand onto the battlefield tapped. This isn't a particularly strong card. Outside of Mono White, I've seen people maybe play it in Mono Blue, but because you have cards like Land Tox, Terrain Generator helps you get those excess lands from your hand into play, and a lot of times you're not even going to fall behind, because sometimes your opponents are ramping a lot more uh, quickly than you are. There's also Core Haven, which is a legendary land that taps for colorless. You can pay one white and tap it to prevent all combat damage that would be dealt by target attacking creature this turn. So this isn't quite as good as Maze of Ith, because uh, you know, it costs one and a white to activate, 
but it does actually tap for mana itself, and you can prevent all combat damage that would be dealt by target attacking creature this turn. Doesn't prevent the damage that would be dealt to it, so you can force your opponent into making really bad attacks where you can actually block and kill their thing, but your blockers stay alive. There's also Scavenger Grounds in this deck as a piece of Graveyard Hate. Uh, this deck actually doesn't have a lot to interact with the graveyard. Scavenger Grounds and Expedition Map are going to let you have the ability to answer graveyard decks uh, without having to sacrifice a non-land slot. You can pay two, tap, sack a desert. It is a desert, so you sack it to itself to exile all cards from all graveyards. There's also Hall of Heliod's Generosity. It's a legendary land that taps for colorless. You can pay one and a white to tap it to put target enchantment card from your graveyard on top of your library. Uh, you know, not going to be activating this too often. It is a pretty big cost to sacrifice a draw, essentially and you have to have enchantments in your graveyard already, but in a pinch can get you back key enchantment to help you maybe answer a threat or put one of your win conditions back on top so you have a second chance of trying to close out a game. Amiria the Sky Ruin is a land that enters the battlefield tapped. I always think that this should have been legendary, but you know, whatever. Uh, at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control seven or more planes, you may return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Be your Amiria Shepherds, your Sun Titans, or you know, your Pristine Angels, or whatever. And it also taps for white, which is nice. Uh, lastly, we have uh, Arch Verazka, which with Ascend, which means if you control ten or more permanents, you get the City's Blessing. It taps for colorless, and you can pay five, tap it, draw a card. Activate this ability only if you have the City's Blessing. Now there is a better version of it in War Room. It does pretty much the same thing, except you don't need to have Ascend. And it costs 3 instead of 5 at the cost of 1 life. Now I don't actually own another one of these cards. I try not to proxy cards, even if I own multiples of them. This is a card I just need to get another... Uh, need to get my hands on another one. And if I do, it will find its way into this deck eventually. So if you look at my deck list, see War Room missing, it's because I don't actually own enough copies of it to have it in this deck as well. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I've been enjoying making these videos. This is my third one now, and I plan on continuing to make them. I don't know if I'm going to make one for every one of my decks, but I will make it for the ones that I think you'll enjoy uh, learning about, or ones that have you know peculiar card choices, or ones where I think I've found unique uh, cards for that particular commander. Uh, please let me know what you think. I'm always interested in getting feedback. Maybe you know some gems that could have ended up in this deck that I overlooked, misjudged, or just don't even know about. This is a vast and interesting game, so I'm very eager to hear your input. Thank you so much. Bye for now.